Okay, so let's begin with the third lecture of Ashwin. Uh, I also uh, should make an announcement that as you have probably noticed, there is no Wi-Fi today because of maintenance. Uh, okay. Okay, so, uh, so finally we are, we are ready to, to leave uh, one dimension. Um, so we'll be talking about dualities in two plus one dimensions today. Uh, but we'll be u u really uh, using a lot of the lessons uh, that we learned in one dimension to kind of organize uh, the discussion. Um, and in particular, what I want to do today uh, is to discuss uh, one of the earliest dualities that, you know, at least... Uh, uh, in the condensed matter literature that was known in, in two dimensions, the duality between uh, bosons uh, in two dimensions, in two spatial dimensions, uh, and uh, vortices. And um, it turns out this is um, extremely useful. Um, and um, you know, what I'd like to do is, uh, I'd like to describe this uh, duality, but um, you know, I want to only tell you things that actually have some kind of a conceptual uh, application uh, so I want to emphasize a couple of applications over here. Um, so this duality uh, allows you to understand uh, phase transitions um, and even some phases, a uh, simple way to understand certain kinds of phases. Um, okay, so uh, it's played a very important role uh, in understanding certain kinds of phase transitions, I'll describe them. Uh, those phase transitions were not uh, accessible using more conventional techniques like the epsilon expansion, uh, but because of this duality, we, we understand them now. Okay, and uh, it also gives you a very powerful tool to look at new kinds of phases. Uh, you know, this has really been, I think, half my career. I've just worked with this duality, and you know, it really opens up a completely new world, a different way of looking at are things that are extremely hard to look at if you insist on working with the original boson degrees of freedom, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so just to remind you in one dimension what happened and how that's gonna translate uh, to the physics in this two-dimensional context. Um, so, <clears throat> okay, so in one dimension what we did was we looked at a model with Z2 symmetry. Yeah, and we developed this uh, uh, duality between two bosonic descriptions. Uh, on the one side, you had the, the spin flips or the charges, and on the other side, you had the domain walls. Okay, those are the two degrees of freedom that we exchanged. Uh, now, if you want to go up to two plus one dimensions, um, <clears throat> if you want to really pursue an analogous uh, you know, line of reasoning, uh, you need to uh, change your symmetry uh, we said that with uh, just Z2 symmetry, the domain walls are no longer particles. Um, you could consider a, a Z2 symmetric model in two dimensions, demand uh, a dual description. Uh, you just wouldn't get a simple theory like the one we got over here. Okay, that's an interesting question for another day. Um, but to really keep this parallel, uh, it makes sense to change what the global symmetry is. Uh, so again, we're going to look for a duality between bosons. Um, and this will be a, a duality between charges uh, and vortices. Okay, so vortices are gonna be point particles in two plus one dimensions. We can develop a theory either in terms of charges or in terms of vortices. Okay, so one important distinction, if you think about these uh, systems, they're both particles in one dimension. Um, so the charges have short range interactions between them and the domain walls also only interact at short distances. Okay, so if you recall why we got this uh, perfect duality between them. Okay, part of it had to do with the model that we looked at. Uh, we looked at a very special model, uh, the Ising model with just nearest neighbor couplings. Uh, you could look at a more general model which just has the symmetry. You can still do this duality and uh, you can describe the system in either of these two variables. Uh, they won't look exactly the same. 
Uh, but morally speaking, they're both described by very similar theories. Okay, essentially, in both cases, there are some real scalar field that have some short range interactions. Okay, so that's where really the self duality came out. Okay, now it will turn out that uh, charges and vortices are both particles in two dimensions. You might think that maybe you will also get a self duality over here. It turns out that's not quite true. Okay, so when charges interact with just when particles, uh, to be a little bit careful about what I mean by charge, so I mean U1 global charge, okay, not, uh, not electromagnetic charge. So these are particles that carry the U1 global charge. Uh, they have short range interactions, but it will turn out that vortices, they interact more like electric charges in two dimensions. Okay, they have long range interactions. We'll actually calculate the interaction potential between a pair of vortices, and the interactions are long ranged. Can they will be mediated by a gauge field? Um, so there won't be a perfect there won't be a self duality over here. These will actually be distinct theories. Okay, they look a little similar, but they are not exactly the same. And actually, that's a lot more useful than having self duality okay, in, in many ways, because knowledge of this theory will give you some information about this one, and vice versa. Okay, and that's where really this our first application is going to come about. We're going to see that the transition where you condense vortices, that transition is very difficult to describe using conventional perturbative uh, techniques. Okay, but by this duality, you have a prediction for what that transition should be. It's uh, something that's related to just the Wilson-Fisher fixed point, and there are a lot of numerical studies that actually show that. Okay, so we'll get to that uh, towards the end. Um, okay, the other thing that we'd like to do is, uh, we said that in one plus one dimension, um, so to continue writing this table, Okay, so we saw, we saw that there was a description of free fermions. Okay, so over here we had this uh, Majorana fermion. Okay, and this eta was a combination of um, the charge and the defect. Okay, and you can demand uh, to know what what happens in two plus one dimension. Uh, is there a way to describe uh, a charged fermion uh, in a similar way um, <clears throat> in two plus one dimensions, uh, but based on uh, the variables in this theory? Okay, and we'll see that there's a very analogous uh, kind of situation over here. Uh, we can write down this free fermion in terms of some fields, uh, which are essentially the bound states of the U1 charge and the vortices. Okay, so it's again a very analogous construction and we'll see the way in which we can implement this binding uh, is using a churn simon term. Okay, and uh, the third thing that I'd like to do that will have to be the last uh, thing I do in the next lecture today um, is to actually come up with a something that's unique to this two plus one dimensional example, which is a fermion fermion duality. Okay, and again, this will have an application which I'm hoping to cover. Uh, it actually has made some very nice predictions uh, about the physics of the half-filled Landau level. Okay, this is a very central problem in the quantum hall physics, um, and it's been worked on for decades. Uh, but after we understood this duality, you could make some new predictions about this half filled Landau level that were not obvious before. Um, and at least there's numerical support uh, that indeed this is on the right track. Okay, so again, I'm hoping to get to that at the end of the, the next lecture uh, today. But that's the plan. Okay, so. Um, so before we start, uh, there were a couple of questions before at the end of the last class. Uh, one question was, um, what is the relation between the kind of models we're looking at um, in this series of lectures and finite temperature statistical mechanics models? Okay, and the simple answer is that we have been looking at zero temperature uh, quantum models. Okay, we're looking at zero temperature quantum icing model. 
in 1 plus 1D. And there's a very precise mapping, at least for the universal quantities, the long distance properties, at finite temperature, but now in two dimensions. And this is StatMec, there's no time. Um, okay, so roughly speaking, the coupling constant on this theory, G, uh, gets mapped to the temperature uh, on this right hand side, the statistical physics model, um, StatMec Ising model. Okay, so this was the one that Onsaga solved exactly. We also got an exact solution over here. The two are related, essentially the time direction over here gets mapped to the extra space dimension over here. Okay, so the dimensions X and T when you do Euclidean time. Okay, so this is probably obvious to many of you, but uh, I was asked this question more than once. Uh, so let me just make that uh, precise. So for every statistical mechanics model, there's a quantum analog, okay, in one lower spatial dimension, which is sitting at zero temperature if you're in the thermodynamic limit over here. Okay, it turns out the interesting thing is the, the converse is not true. There are quantum models that have no statistical mechanics analog. Okay, you can go to one higher dimension, but in some cases, the weights don't look like positive numbers. Um, so this mapping is, you know, always goes from a StatMec model to a quantum mechanics model. Okay, and uh, similarly, I'll be talking now about the zero temperature physics of a 2 plus 1D U1 model. Sometimes I'll call it the XY model because you can think of this as a, mo as a magnet which has spins that live in the XY plane. Um, and again, there's a relation to the three-dimensional statistical mechanics uh, of an XY And, and this is at finite temperature. Okay, so there are connections to statistical physics, um, but I'll somehow prefer talking about zero temperature quantum, just a, a matter of taste. Uh, I like to do Hamiltonians. If you do Hamiltonians, you kind of buy yourself a dimension. Okay, it's, it's a little bit easier to write things down in one lower dimension and then you use the Hamiltonian uh, formulation. Okay, but that's just a question of taste and you can when you write Lagrangians for these problems, they look exactly like the StatMec Lagrangians. Yeah. They're very different systems, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, and also, once you start talking about, uh, you know, for example, this fermion-fermion duality, uh, there are really no StatMec analogs of that, once you have fermions. Uh, where on both sides you have fermions, the physical degrees of freedom of fermions. Um, so then, yeah, that's another thing to be kept in mind. Yeah. Um, yeah, so for example, um, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, the question is, are there examples where you can write down a zero temperature quantum model, but there is no analogous statistical mechanics model in one higher dimension. Okay, so one example is uh, the spin a half, spin one half Heisenberg model in one dimension. Um, okay, so spin a half is um, on every side, uh, and we call it the chain because that's 1D. Okay, so you can write down a field theory for this model uh, in terms of a uh, you know, nonlinear sigma model, so there's some vector n. Uh, so there's a Lagrangian, which is, looks like dn squared. That in itself can very easily be mapped to the side, but it turns out it also has a topological term. Um, there's a term that looks like, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, it, it has various, Actually, I think I just need the topological term over here. There's some theta sitting over here. Okay, and it turns out that this term, uh, it's like a Berry's phase term. Uh, it has a linear derivative in time, and there's an integral over the time. Okay, and there's a factor of i. It gives you different phase factors for different topological configurations of your vector field. Okay, so now let's try to continue this to uh, Euclidean time. 
Okay, so T becomes I tau, T becomes I tau, but the I's cancel out. So even in Euclidean time, you have a, a, a weight for the different configurations that's complex. Okay. In fact, this is just, it ultimately turns out we are the plus or minus one. But the Boltzmann weights, the thing that you would like to identify with Boltzmann weights are no longer positive. Okay, so this, you can call it a stat -mech model, but because it's, the weights are non-positive, it doesn't obey the usual axioms of statistical mechanics. Okay, so this, at least on this basis, it does not have a statistical mechanics uh, kind of uh, extension. Okay, and those are some of the most interesting problems, actually, where you cannot go into a stat -mech model in one higher dimension. Okay, so uh, if there are no more questions, uh, let me proceed with, um, you know, talking about this, uh, the U1 model um, <clears throat> and, you know, implementing this, uh, this duality. Okay, okay so we have some, a model with, let me call psi being the, uh, the operator, it could be creating bosons. There's some U1 charge that's conserved. You could think of this as just boson number. And under this U1, suppose you have some symmetry operations parameterized by, it's a continuous symmetry over here. Uh, you rotate this by a phase. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so these are U1 charged. And uh, what we'd like to do, just like with the uh, icing model, uh, we can write down a phase diagram for an appropriate microscopic model. Um, so I won't actually bore you with the details. Uh, I'll put it up in the notes. Uh, but imagine that you have some uh, bosonic field, okay, which is, has got a kinetic energy. Uh, <clears throat> there's some... Okay, so in this Lagrangian size, a complex field. Okay, and uh, we can obviously see that there could be two phases. Uh, so if I draw the phase diagram. Okay, it's a function of R, depending on the sign of R. Uh, if R is positive, as usual, I have this field to be gapped. Um, so this is a gap phase. If you like, it's like the vacuum. There are no bosons in the ground state. Um, but then I take R negative, I, I end up condensing, uh, condensing these bosons and giving the Bose field an expectation value. Okay, so very much like our icing model, there's a symmetry broken phase and there's a gap phase. Okay, the distinction over here is because this is a continuous symmetry. Uh, in the Bose condensed phase, um, there are actually gapless excitations. Okay, so uh, in the condensed phase, the Goldstone modes. And uh, this simply comes out because you have uh, this large number of different equivalent uh, vacua, so you have psi being condensed, uh, but this could be any amplitude times a phase, okay, and um, as long as it locally has the right amplitude, uh, this is a ground state, uh, but different parts of your sample could have, uh, you know, different ground states, so as a function of position, uh, you could have phi, and as a function of time as well, uh, this phase could vary. Uh, so you can write down an effective theory just for the phase. Uh, you stick in this, uh, into this expression. It'll have the minimum potential energy. It's just the phase that's varying. Uh, but this term will pick up some additional uh, action. Okay, so there'll be some additional uh, effect. There's an effective Lagrangian describing these fluctuations of phase. Uh, you take the derivative uh, on this field, psi. Uh, it doesn't act on the amplitude that's constant, just on the phase, and you get basically d phi squared times some overall coefficient. Okay, usually the, there's a factor of two that, um, that comes in. Maybe I should put a factor of two here. 
and this rho s is just modulus of sine naught squared. Okay, that's the strength of this condensate. Um, and of course, if you look at the equations of motion over here, uh, you'll have a gapless mode. Its energy um, will be proportional to the, the momentum. It's uh, just this relativistic kind of mode. Uh, so that's the, the ordered phase over here is the Goldstone mode. Okay, so that's one dif difference uh, from, the, from the Ising model case. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, the second distinction is in terms of the topological defects. Um, okay, so, so, the one was the Goldstone modes. That's one property of the condensed phase. The second is the topological defects. Okay, so again, here you're, you're looking at low energy configurations. Um, so you, you take a loop in parameter space. Um, this is a function here of a, if you can parameterize ground states by just the phase. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so we're gonna demand that you have exactly the right amplitude and the phase can, can wind around. And that's a good way of getting a low energy configuration uh, because the only contribution to the energy is coming from the variation in space of this configuration. Okay, so if I look at it, just take a snapshot in any little region, uh, it just looks like the ground state, one of this whole family of ground state. Um, so there's no energy cost coming from this term all of it is gonna come from the potential, potential term. Okay, so uh, locally it looks like a ground state. Okay, and the question is, can you, can you put down uh, this collection of ground states in such a way that it's hard to unwind them? Okay, that they're really topologically uh, stable. Um, so we want to look at how this phase can wind. And uh, the important thing is that the phase itself is not physical. Okay, so the phase and the phase plus any multiple of two pi uh, is exactly identical. Okay, there's a redundancy in terms of what, what uh, phase you assign. Uh, the only thing that is physical is exponential of the phase. Okay, that's really the, the physical quantity. Uh, you can think of this very pictorially. If you have a, a magnet, if you're really just describing the, the state of spins in a magnet, uh, we have them living on a circle and uh, you know, we can specify the angle. There's some ambiguity in specifying this angle, whether you can add a two pi to it, uh, but the exponential of the phase is simply the location on the circle of the spin. Okay, that's completely physical. Uh, this is really the physical quantity. Okay, but it pays to actually talk in terms of this unphysical quantity, as long as you remember that it doesn't have to be single valued, for example. Okay, there are two completely equivalent configurations, uh, phi and phi plus two pi, for example, uh, that describe exactly the same physical situation. Okay, so for example, when you go around this loop, um, you know, if this was a physical quantity, you'd have to come back to yourself at the end of this procedure. But now because this is not a physical quantity, you could accumulate uh, some phase and you could come back, it's physically the same, uh, but you can be off, but you can only be off by this amount. Okay, and if you're off by multiples of two pi, uh, you're actually back to the same configuration. Okay, so in other words, if I were to take the integral, the line integral of gradient of phi, if this was a normal function, uh, the, the line integral around a closed loop uh, should be zero okay, for any physical uh, quantity uh, for a function that's single valued. Okay, but uh, phi is not such a function. You, you're forgiven if you come back by multiples of two pi, okay? Okay, and these correspond to topological defects. Uh, they're called topological defects because you can sense them uh, very far away from, uh, from the origin. <clears throat> okay, so you have a defect somewhere here. Uh, you can go very far away and just uh, measure what the phase is doing and you can figure out that inside somewhere there's gotta be a topological defect. You just do this integral by measuring the phi on going around it. Yeah, and these are, of course, the vortices. Um, 
Okay, so you have vortices that they're classified by an integer. Okay, you can think of this as the charge of the vortex. Okay, so a charge one and a charge minus one vortex, you put them together, they can annihilate and they can give you the smooth configuration. Um, so there's a notion of vortices and anti-vortices and you can add vorticity and get higher vorticity and so on. Okay, so let's um, calculate the energy of one of these vortices. Um, and a couple of interesting, important points that come out. Uh, okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so to set up this calculation, uh, I want to think about my system as living on a disk uh, with a certain radius, let me call it big L. Okay, so this disk is supposed to model the separation between a vortex anti-vortex pair. Okay, so let's say I have a vortex at the center of this disk. I have an anti-vortex somewhere here. Okay, and um, if I want to look at the, the interaction between this pair of uh, objects, uh, what I can do is I can calculate the total energy of the vortex, add it to the anti-vortex, uh, that's a rough estimate of the total energy of this configuration. It'll tell you how much energy you need to put in uh, to drag a pair of this vortex, anti-vortex uh, apart, okay, distance L, 2L apart. Okay, so, um, so for that, we just use this, uh, uh, this en uh, energy over here uh, to calculate, uh, you know, the energy of this vortex. So the energy uh, in those uh, variables is gradient of phi squared. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so in the radial direction, uh, you know, let's say there's not much variation. All of the variation is going to be uh, around this, um, on going around. So the vortex configuration I want to think about is phi is essentially the angle theta uh, that you, you subtend as you go around. Okay, that's a unit uh, vortex. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so when I take the gradient, uh, I have d by dr, and I have one over r d by d theta. Okay, it's only the second term that's gonna give me any uh, energetics. Uh, so the energy density, Okay, so if I just take the gradient of uh, the phase where it's winding by the angle, uh, that's the energy density. And then I've got to integrate it over this disk uh, to get the entire uh, energy. Okay, so let me I'll introduce another. Um, you want to do this to get the uh, energy of a vortex. Okay, so you can do the radial integral. That's uh, easy, uh, sorry, the... Um, the angular integral, that gives you two pi r. Okay, and um, okay, at this point, you have to do the radial integral. Uh, and you see that in order to define this energy, not only do you need an upper cutoff over here, uh, the system size L, you also need a lower cutoff. And um, you know, essentially, that means you need a certain region um, you know, a little region around the, the origin where the amplitude itself will go to zero. Okay, so we're saying that this phase winds around as theta, so your wave function looks, your amplitude looks like e to the i theta. And of course, this theta is winding around, and as you get to the origin, uh, this becomes ill-defined, right? You cannot have this winding around just at the origin, just at that one point, uh, the angle is ill-defined. So the only way this can make sense of, is if this amplitude psi itself goes to zero. Okay, so we want that near the origin, psi naught itself goes to zero for some radius that's within a core radius, okay, RC. Uh, you need that kind of regularization uh, for these objects to exist. Okay, so there's gonna be a, 
a lower limit RC. Uh, in our lattice models, there's no problem because this RC is just going to be the spacing between the lattice sites. Okay, so if you have a lattice model and you have, and you define a complex scalar field, there are always going to be vortices. Okay, so the subtlety is when you define a continuum model, you have to be a little careful to, so that you allow for the possibility of vortices. Okay, that's something that you explicitly need to ensure. Uh, there are actually two kinds of models you can define. They look superficially the same. You could write on a model that's just this, gradient of phase squared, um, and you may be committing to a model that has no vortices. Okay, if you do not allow for events where the amplitude drops to zero at some points, it's a very small energy cost you pay over there to drop the amplitude to zero, uh, but then you can make these kind of vortex defects. Okay, so, uh, so it's important to keep in mind that in continuum theories, you have to define it appropriately to get these topological defects. Okay, and you, you can miss them uh, if you have the wrong kind of uh, regularization. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, you pay that energy. So the total energy of the vortex is going to be the energy that I calculate now, plus some constant amount that's related to that core energy. Yeah. And you'll see that the, this one will dominate, at least for dilute vortices. Okay, so let's do this integral. Um, so it's just one over R. Um, so this is just pi rho s log of L divided by RC. Okay, that's the energy of this vortex um, of, of a, within a disk of radius L. Okay, but I want to think of this as a proxy for the interaction energy between a pair of vortices. Uh, essentially, it tells me that the potential between a pair of vortices um, uh, is, is, is going as log of uh, the separation. Okay, so I can think of this as the distance to the anti-vortex where this, the field will become uniform. Um, it's, it scales as log of L, so it's essentially the, the potential between them is scaling as the log of the separation. Okay, so that's exactly the electrostatics of charges uh, that are confined to two dimensions. Okay, so if you have electric charges where the field lines do not leave the plane, then the potential between a, pair, a charge and uh, opposite charge uh, will simply be the log of the separation. Okay, so this is 2D electrostatics. Okay, so this is to motivate for you, um, you know, we're, going to, we're not going to derive the theory for psi. Uh, you can do that, and I have some notes on that, but I won't have time to do that. I want to motivate uh, the form of this dual theory. So the vortices are also point particles, so they'll also be de described in terms of some complex field psi. Uh, but you've got to take into account the fact that they behave as though they are charges in two dimensions. Okay, so unlike this field over here, this field simply has short range interactions. The interactions between the particles are summarized by the side of the fourth term. Essentially, particles interact only when they sit on top of each other. Okay, but now we want to modify this, the dual theory, in terms of a vortex field, which will uh, behave like charges in two dimensions. Okay, and the simplest way we can do that, that's consistent with like Lorentz invariance, uh, is to just add a gauge potential and give that gauge potential a Maxwell action. Okay, so that's the first, um, you know, kind of uh, motivation uh, for writing down a dual theory that involves uh, gauge fields. Okay. Um, <clears throat> yeah, let me give you another motivation, which is, uh, okay, so we have these objects, these uh, uh, vortices and anti-vortices that whose number is conserved. Okay, there's a topological conservation number, uh, there's a topological quantum number, the vortices. Okay, the vorticity is a topological quantum number, it's conserved. Uh, we'd like to have a model that captures that. Okay, so it's very much like electric charges. Uh, if you think about, uh, you know, electrostatics, for example, um, you have this uh, kind of defect in the electric field. Okay, if you have a charge, uh, that's the source of electric field. You can just think of it as a kink, 
a point from where all the electric charges uh, emanate. Uh, we call such things electric charges. Okay, so you can either just look at topological defects of the electric field uh, and call that object an electric charge. Okay, in which case your um, okay, so and uh, you assign a Gauss law uh, to keep track of these electric charges. And of course, we know that uh, you know this is like a uh, a topological quantum number. There's no uh, global symmetry associated with these charges. Charges are conserved not because of global symmetry, but really because they are topological defects in the electric field. Okay, so there are points where everything comes out. You can't get rid of that unless you get a point where everything comes in, okay, and then you can make them, uh, smoothen them out. Um, so this is a good model of keeping track of some other topological quantum number, like vortices. Okay, so what we'll do is we'll introduce a electric field, let's call it little e. Um, okay, and we'd like to uh, write down a field so that its divergence is the density of vortices. Okay, so that's another reason why you might imagine that some gauge fields will come into play when you try to keep track of this topological quantum number. Okay, so in fact, we can solve for what this electric field is uh, in terms of things that we already know. Okay, so we said that there's a phase field phi. Okay, and the integral of the phase field um, okay, so this is the uh, density of charges of vortices uh, that's inside this uh, uh, inside the area that's swept out by this uh, by this curve. Okay, so I do the integral over here, and this is the area inside. Okay, so I can convert this by Stokes' theorem into a, um, <clears throat> yeah, sorry, so this was two pi times the, yeah, so let me use one over two pi times curl of grad phi, ds is, okay, so in other words, the, the candidate for, um, <clears throat> for my electric field um, is the following. Uh, I can take my, okay, so we want that curl of grad phi over two pi is divergence of the electric field. Okay, so in order to make this equality. Um, okay, so of course, usually the curl of a gradient is just zero. Um, but in this case, it's non-zero uh, because these are, this is not a, a single-valued function, um, and you can get this, uh, this non-zero curve. Okay, so if you solve this, you find that the electric field, the ith component, is the anti-symmetric um, anti tensor. Um, so epsilon 1, 2 is 1, epsilon 2, 1 is minus 1, all the others 0, uh, times the derivative acting on phi, okay, divided by 2 pi. Okay, so in fact, you can write down the, the, uh, the field strength, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> okay, so more generally, the relativistic generalization of this will be, um, let me have it up there. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry. So this is always, there's like a Z hat. So I'm using 3D notation for the curl, but then you take the dot product with Z hat. Okay, so, um, so you can see, for example, this term, uh, this kind of term that gives you a gradient of phi squared kind of energetics uh, is going to simply be a Maxwell term. Okay, just the square of this F squared. Okay, so with all this motivation, uh, let me just try to write down what, I, what we think the dual theory would look like. Um, so unlike the Ising case, we didn't have that much microscopic direction over here. 
uh, but I feel we have some, we have developed some intuition. Uh, so let's try it on the vortex Lagrangian. Okay, so there'll be a term that involves the psi, let's call it vortex, that's gonna be our vortex field. And another term which is the Maxwell. Okay, so the, the scheme will be that let's guess, let's guess the answer, and then we're gonna check it. Okay, we're gonna check if it reproduces this phase diagram. Okay, and if it does, then it gives us some belief. Then we'll do another check. We'll check if it gives the right responses. Um, and then we'll be sort of, um, you know, just satisfied and then start looking at applications. Okay, so, um, so this will be, again, a fight of the fourth kind of theory. Uh, so don't take these coefficients very seriously. Uh, maybe I should be putting in some coefficients in front of these terms. Um, <clears throat> so there is a, a gradient term, but now it comes as a covariant derivative because I have them, um, these vortices are not local objects, if you like. They actually, you create a phase field everywhere around, um, and that's, uh, you know, these non-local objects could appear coupled to a gauge field. Okay, and we have argued why these vortices are like charges, therefore they should carry gauge charge. Okay, and then there's uh, the usual, let's call it R prime, psi vortex and some lambda prime, psi to the fourth. Okay, and then I have, this is my vortex, and then there's a Maxwell term, which is essentially this elastic energy of the rotations of this phase, um, and let me call that one over two um, <clears throat> kappa. Um, I can just use what I had before. I know it's gonna be rho s divided by two. Um, you knew, you knew where, in terms of the vector potentials, just to be completely clear, F mu nu is delta mu A nu minus delta nu A nu. Okay, so this theory uh, we, are, we are claiming is dual to this one. And yeah. Okay, can you count the degrees of freedom? <laughs> How did you do that? Uh huh. Yeah. But uh, I guess maybe the point is that a gauge field, you shouldn't count, you know, when you have a gauge theory, uh, it's a question of whether you should count that complex field as really a complex field, right? Because it's coupled to the gauge field. So, um, you know, for example, you cannot directly measure psi itself. Psi v cannot be measured, it's not gauge invariant. Um, yeah, so you'll see that actually this is, um, you know, so we know that in this theory there are actually vortices, and the vortex degrees of freedom are represented by this. So, you know, in some sense we are just shifting the focus to something else. And uh, it should, uh, you know, if you have more degrees of freedom, you'll see it as some extra mode or something like that. You'll, um, you know, unless it's always gapped, in which case it's probably okay. Um, okay, so anyway, let's check if the, um, if the phase diagram works out. Okay, uh, and it turns out it'll, it will, of course, uh, but in a very strange way. Okay, the way in which it works out is extremely strange, um, and it tells you a lot about, uh, you know, some very basic things like photons in two dimensions and Goldstone modes. Okay, it turns out they're equivalent. Okay, so, uh, so let's do the easy one. Okay, and it turns out the easy one is actually this condensed phase. Okay, so, um, so 
the condensed phase over here was to take R negative and condense this boson field. Okay, so over here, any suggestion for how we can get the, the same phase? Okay, so my first instinct would be to take R prime negative as well, but that's wrong. Okay, um, so you might think that if you condense that, you should condense this as well, but in fact, there's sort of an opposite relation between them. Okay, if the boson is condensed, the vortices are not. And if the bosons are gapped, the vortices are condensed. Okay, so R negative over here, the condensed phase of the bosons, uh, I want R prime positive, okay, and have these vortices to be gapped. Okay, so the vortex field, the psi V is gonna be gapped, uh, has no expectation value. So I can essentially ignore that part of the theory. Okay, these particles are up at very high energies. They may carry gate charge, but they're up at high energies. And if I look at the low energy dynamics, the only thing that's left uh, are the photons, okay, are the gauge fields. Okay, so this line of reasoning, um, so the original condensed phase, uh, okay, which corresponded to R less than zero in the original theory, uh, which had Goldstone modes, okay, over here will correspond to R prime greater than zero, vortices gapped, Okay, but at low energies, you have these photons that are free to propagate because there's no gate-charged matter hanging around. They're all up at high energies. So the photon will propagate. This is a Coulomb phase. Okay, so, uh, okay, so for this to match, you have to identify the photon over here uh, with the Goldstone mode. Okay, that's the only way this is gonna work. Okay, so the Goldstone mode is the phi, and the photon is just the Maxwell action. Yeah, that's right, yeah. And that makes sense because they are, you know, from this reasoning, we already had this connection. That's right, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so if you didn't know that part of the discussion, you could still come up with these two effective theories and ask how they correspond. Okay, so it turns out a Goldstone mode in two plus one dimensions can be represented as a photon, okay, and vice versa. So it may seem, okay, they're both gapless, what's the big deal, right? But it turns out you cannot do this in three dimensions. Okay, so this is, um, it's a very special feature of two dimensions. Okay, photons are not, not interchangeable with Goldstone modes. Okay, photons have two polarizations, for example, in three dimensions. Uh, you can't do this kind of duality in 3D. Okay, it's very special to two dimensions. Three plus one, one plus three. Okay, so that's one phase that we got. Uh, that's good for our theory. Uh, what about the other phase, which is the gap phase in the original construction? Um, okay, so this is gap bosons. How do I describe it in terms of the vortices? Um, <clears throat> okay, and of course, the only other option I have is to take this R prime negative, condense the vortices. You know, that sounds like trouble. We want to end up getting a gap phase but I'm condensing these vortices. That sounds like that's gonna give me a Goldstone mode. And I also have the photon. Okay, so it looks like I'm gonna get two gapless degrees of freedom rather than none. Okay, but all of you I'm sure are familiar with this problem. Uh, this is the problem of the Higgs. Um, this is the Higgs problem. And of course we know that it's solved. The gapless photon eats up this Goldstone mode and you get a, a, a gap uh, to all the excitations. Okay, so by the Higgs mechanism, this is also gapped. Okay, so this is the Higgs phase. Okay, so there's no low energy excitation, no gapless excitation. Okay, by the Higgs mechanism. Okay, so the photon gets gapped. 
There is no Goldstone mode because you never really broke a symmetry. Uh, there's no global symmetry of this IV. They're actually a gauge. Uh, it's part of this gauge symmetry, so you don't expect a Goldstone mode. That's one way of thinking about it. And the photon is gapped because you have this uh, condensate of these IVs. Okay, it's trying to propagate through this high density of gate charge, and of course it requires a mass. Okay, so there's another nice thing that you can do is um, you can sit in this gapped phase. Uh, I'm out of time or something? Or, oh, okay. Um, you can sit in this gap phase, and you can ask, um, what does the boson look like if I'm uh, using this to describe the phase? Okay, so we're talking about a phase where the bosons are gapped. I found a different equivalent description of that phase in terms of a, essentially what is a superconductor, right? I have a, a gate-charged object that condensed. It's coupled to an electromagnetic field. Okay, so, um, so what does the boson look like um, uh, in, this, uh, in this language? Okay, so let's say I'm in the phase where I give an expectation value to psi v. Okay, these are within quotes because this is not really a gauge invariant object to begin with, but we kind of know what we mean, right? This is like the Higgs phase, you condense this object. Um, and let's say you're in that phase, you want to understand what the bosons are. Yeah, does someone know what the bosons look like in this language? Um, so I have a condensate of these vortices. Okay, so I have psi v, which is condensed uh, with the usual caveats. Um, and you can imagine making a vortex in this. Right? So this is also a complex field. Right? And you can try to make a vortex in this. So there's a vortex of the vortex condensate. Right? So let's imagine the psi v winds around, makes a vortex. Um, And of course, this is uh, carries gate charge. Um, so if I write, write this down um, as psi naught V, e to the i phi V, some phase of this vortex condensate. Uh, if I write on an effective action for the phase, you'll get gradient phi V uh, minus the, the vector potential that it's coupled to. Okay, so different from the previous case, there's now a vector potential over here. Uh, and you'd like to minimize this energy. Okay, so previously we said that when you're trying to minimize the energy of a vortex, you have to integrate this gradient phi squared. Uh, but now you can cancel it off against a gauge potential. Okay, so you can actually make this vortex into a finite energy object by supplying the right amount of gauge flux. Okay, so if you have at large distances, you have the grad, grad phi V minus A is just zero. Okay. Uh, if this thing itself goes to zero at large distances, this integral is just zero, um, then this object becomes something with, which has finite energy, okay, not an energy that grows logarithmically. Uh, so for this, you need that the integral of A itself is some um, two pi times some integer. Okay, so you can make this vortex, you can make it finite energy by supplying some gauge flux. Yeah, and this is quantized uh, to integers. Okay, so the excitations uh, of this fluid, um, the vortex excitations, they are also quantized, but they only carry finite energy. Okay, so that sounds a lot like the boson excitations. Okay, so the boson excitations come quantized. You can have one particle or two particles and so on, and they only have finite energy interactions between them. Okay, so this is very likely just the bosons of the original model. Okay, so there's a completely dual description. If you were to, if someone gave me this theory, I can say, oh, look, it has certain vortex excitations. I can try to build up a theory 
in terms of the vortex excitations of psi v, but I find those excitations are only short range interactions, so I could go back and write down this theory for that. Okay, I would write down a theory again in terms of particles described by some complex field, but no long range interactions that only have this contact interaction. Okay, so it's kind of self consistent. You can go either way just by making these gentle arguments. Okay, so, um, so it's sometimes kind of convenient to keep track of the boson density, of keep track of this global U1 charge by introducing an external electromagnetic field. Okay, just like a source term that keeps track of it. Um, so just to keep track of the global U1, let me just add a grad minus I big A. Okay, so A is just some external field which couples to the global U1. Yeah, and the question is, what is that, how does that appear over here? Okay, so now there should be an extra term that keeps track of this uh, external vector potential. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and it's easy to guess what that is. Uh, we just said that the flux of little a uh, the integral of little a on a line integral, which is actually the surface integral of curl of little a, uh, is the boson density. Okay, so this, um, so this additional term, let me just write it down. is uh, just the flux of that, so it's uh, delta nu A lambda divided by two pi times epsilon. Okay, that's the way in which it will couple. Every time I have a flux of two pi over here, it's like a unit boson charge, which couples to this external electromagnetic field. Okay, so this is sometimes called a BF term. Um, not very sure why, but uh, this is an A and D little, D, A little f term. Okay, and uh, mo I think most of, the, most of what I've done for the last few lectures, I've, I've dropped factors of two very liberally. This is one place where you cannot drop your factors of two. You've got to get your factors of two right for these kind of terms. Okay, so now with this, uh, we can actually go a little bit further. Um, how much time do I have? Okay, not too much time. So let me just tell you about the applications. Um, okay, so one of the applications that I said was um, in terms of the phase transition. Uh, so we identified the two phases, um, and now we can look at the critical point, and we can we obtain a duality for the critical point. Okay, so the duality for the critical point is we're going to set r equal to zero over here. Just to raise this term, we have tuned to the critical point. That's one theory. This is just a Wilson-Fisher critical point. We call it Wilson-Fisher. Okay, and the dual critical theory is, again, tuning to the point where these vortices are just massless. Um, you know, colloquially, we'll set, do that by setting this R to zero. Uh, and this is a different critical point. Okay, it's called, it's a superconductor. called 3D superconductor critical point. Okay, and the, the, if you believe the rest of the story, uh, you might also guess that the critical theories of these two are, are the same. Okay, just two equivalent ways. You can either take a, a, a complex scalar coupled to a gauge field and make that gapless, just at the point at which it will undergo the Higgs transition. Or you can think of a, a, a scalar field that does not couple to any long range forces, no, uh, no dynamical gauge fields, also undergoing a condensation transition. And the, the condensing is happening in opposite directions. Uh, this condenses from, you know, from the right to the left, the other one condenses from the left to the right. Okay, it goes from gap to condensed in opposite directions. Okay, so it turns out that people had studied this theory before and they had tried to do an epsilon expansion. Okay, so th there were parallel efforts in both condensed matter and field theory literature. Um, and what they found is that if you are near four dimensions, uh, there is no fixed point. Okay, so this is called Halperin-Ma 
uh, and in the um, But this guy, the so this 3D superconductor. Okay, it's actually the, let me just call it the superconductor. Uh, if you're close to, if you're close to four-dimensional statistical mechanics models, or one plus three dimensions, so if you're either at four dimensions or very slightly away, uh, it looks like a, a first-order transition. Okay, and uh, you can make it second order by having multiple flavors of this, uh, of this vortex field. So you have n vortex greater than or equal to 365. Only then do you find a continuous transition. Okay, so basically, the epsilon expansion is really kind of screaming at you that this is not going to give you a fixed point. Okay, but of course, three dimensions is a long way from four dimensions. Right? If you drop down in dimension, uh, we now believe that there should be a continuous transition, which is completely opaque in this way of writing the problem, uh, but which is captured by this dual theory. Okay, so people have done numerical simulations of this model. Just take this model on a lattice, simulate it numerically, um, and what they find is that it does indeed seem to go to a fixed point where the exponents are exactly the same as the three-dimensional XY model, okay, which is the same as this theory. Okay, so um, there's still more work to be done in numerics. What you actually want to do is you want to go to the limit of very small charge, um, so that's really like very large rho s, uh, and see that along that entire line of, um, uh, of uh, you know, parameters, you flow from the lattice scale to that fixed point. Okay, it's not quite been done, but there are many models where you, you know, many different studies, you take this kind of model on the lattice with some finite coupling strength, and it seems to be given by this kind of criticality. Okay, and this is a very important question because we have superconductors in three dimensions. Okay, so you think about it as a classical statmec problem. If I give you a superconductor in three dimensions, I heat it up, you lose superconductivity. That uh, physics is described by this model with the fluctuating gauge field. Uh, and you'd like to know what is the universality class of that transition. Okay, and uh, you know, it appears that again, this is really the right theory. There's no earthly reason why you would think about this uh, you know, if you were just talking about charged particles that have Coulomb interactions, but this is really the theory of the vortex lines, which actually have short-range interactions. Okay, that's why they're described by this theory. Okay, so that's one uh, application. Actually, how much time do I have? Uh, I'm out, out of time, okay. So just a word about the other one, which is in the notes. Um, so here, what we did was we condensed the vortices. You can ask what happens if I condense not one, but a pair of vortices. Okay, so that's like condensing, it's like the Higgs mechanism, but not in the fundamental uh, representation of this gauge field, uh, of this gauge group. Uh, it's actually some charge two object that condenses. Okay, so that's very easy to describe in terms of these vortices. It turns out in terms of bosons, that gives you a very exotic phase. Okay, so if you condense pairs of vortices, uh, it turns out that if you go through the same analysis, um, the defect that you can make in that condensate actually has half the vorticity that it previously had. Okay, so you run through this logic, it tells you that the excitations, okay, in the psi v squared condensed phase, actually carry half charge of the global U1. Okay, so it's like if you start with a model of bosons, uh, you get excitations that are like half of the boson. And uh, so that's an exotic phase that only occurs with very strong interactions between the bosons. It's usually hard to describe in terms of the original bosons. You know, how do you fractionalize one boson? It's really a many, it's a many body effect, uh, but it's sort of trivial to describe in terms of these dual variables. Okay, so things that are hard in this language are sort of trivial in this other language, okay, many things. Um, and that's why it's particularly kind of interesting. Okay, and another open question, uh, we just talked about some uh, you know, this distinction between zero temperature and finite temperature in different dimensions. Um, you know, it turns out that these two phases, this is like a insulator phase for the bosons. Uh, the bosons just do not conduct. Uh, this is like a superfluid. Uh, and in between, you get a metal. Okay, so there's a metal right in between, which has a finite conductivity. 
and there's a lot of interest in trying to calculate uh, this conductivity. It's very hard to do uh, theoretically because you have to use real time rather than this imaginary time formulation. Okay, so there's a lot of interest in doing that and uh, there's some hope that using this dual description you get some constraints on it. Okay, so um, you know, there, there are, there's a similar question for this uh, dual theory. It gives you a different answer but that's related to the resistivity of your problem. Okay, so anyway, the, the main message is that once you have this new set of variables, it's like you can explore a lot of new physics that's very hard to do in the original variables. Maybe I'll stop there.